having a purpose and having a passion is by focusing on that, everything else is going to fall into place. In today's episode, we have special guest Rockstar Allstate agent Paul Bannister. We're going to be discussing scaling a business, how to manage four offices all virtually. Um, Paul shares a really amazing seven-step process right now of what his team is doing to help offset those uh, those call-ins that none of us like, but the, the rate increase call-ins and how his team is creating a wow experience in turning that so-called rate increase call into a really amazing call to where they're driving referrals at the end of the conversation. Don't worry about stopping and, and writing down the seven-step process. You can actually go to the show notes and download the seven-step process. We've created a PDF for you. With that being said, let's start the show. Hey, welcome to the Insurance Buzz. We are your host, Michael and Courtney Weaver, and we have a special guest today, Paul Bannister. Paul, what's going on, man? What is happening? Thank you for, for having me. Dude, thank you so much. So those of you, you, you don't know this, but me and Paul go back a long ways to the producer days, early 20s, straight out of school, getting into insurance. We used to have a little friendly competition every month. Oh yeah, for sure. Like we were on separate teams and <laughs> I knew what this dude Michael was doing. I want to make sure he knew what I was doing. And uh, we're all like on the state farm team, but it's like there can't, it's like Highlander, right? There can't be nobody better than me out there. <laughs> and there was one. And then we would like battle it out, you know, like, I'd write a certain number of policies and then I'd make sure that that got trickled over to you and then you <laughs> come and beat that. And then that get trickled back to me. And I'm like, dang it. But I, yep. I have to tell you that that competition between the two of us, and I think it was totally friendly. Like you, you talk to me, I'd come visit you and learn about what you're doing. But at the end of the day, like iron sharpens iron, man. That's what, that's all that was of, um, you know, us competing with each other, trying to get better, trying to, <laughs> You know, I don't even know if I ever looked at my comp statement. I just want to beat you, right? I just want to be number one, <laughs> right? At the end of the day, if I'm number one, uh, then I'm gonna probably be doing okay. And uh, that was a that was a fun time. But that is that has been a minute ago. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I remember. It's funny that we're having this conversation now because Michael and I were just dating, and I remember him coming home and talking about Tall Paul <laughs> and. <laughs> How many apps tall Paul had? And I'm like, whoa, dude, you, you're this is gone to a whole different level. But I think it I think it was incredible to have, and I think that it's a, kind of a great place to start. Is that having somebody to run with and really pushing you? That maybe it is a friendly competition because I think that's how high achievers are are wired. Is like, am I better than you? Like, can I? But I mean, you guys were having, you were hitting the Century Club over and over and over again. I mean, you were doing 100 plus app months when at the time everyone was like, what the hell is going on? I didn't know anything. I'm like, yeah, is that good? You're like, yeah, this is, this is good. But you're not a producer anymore, no, Paul Bannister. No, <laughs> a different role now, now the owner with the name on the door. And so... That is uh that is definitely a, a totally different role and a totally different learning curve. So how did you get to where you are now? Because we've we've transitioned companies and what your role and your identity looks like. So kind of walk back. What happened from producer to where you are right now? What was that journey like? For sure. Well, so I was uh, I was fortunate to work with two really really good agents um, through State Farm. Two different agents. One that was hands-on, another one that was hands-off and and uh, and more about running the business, kind of the e-myth mentality. Um, and I just, I learned a ton from from both of them. Um, when I went to Oklahoma is when I worked for another agent and it was, you know, to follow my wife for her, her news career. But um, when she actually got an opportunity back in Kansas City, where she's from and where we're from, it was like, oh, well, I've done this producer game for a while. I guess it's time to step up to the big leagues and be an owner. And uh, at the time I bled State Farm Red, like there is no other company out there. 
Uh, but the opportunities that were out there, once I searched and tried to find what was the best for me, um, Allstate was a route that I chose to go through. Um, the ability to purchase and acquire agencies just made a ton of sense with how I wanted to scale my business. And so uh, so from there, I, I purchased my uh, my first agency in Missouri that was actually in Springfield while I lived in Kansas City. Um, I, I purchased with no intent of actually ever moving there, but just trying to purchase the largest agency that was available because I had the experience of working in a larger agency. And then with a the plan of like, quickly scaling it to 10 million as quickly as and as fastly as we could. And, uh, you know, again, with the, the model that I was a part of, we were able to purchase again in St. Louis a couple years later, and then we were able to purchase a couple smaller agencies uh, in the last year to get to where we are, uh, are today. Okay. So you, what year would, what, what year would have this have been when you purchased your first one? 2015. So you were running an office virtually before running an office virtually was cool. For sure. Yes. It, uh, it was a thing that, uh, back then they didn't want me to talk about not going into my office, uh, cause they wanted the agents to be in the office, but the, you know, using zoom, um, having some virtual tracking, having, having, uh, accountability and expectations. And, um, you know, that's something that we've been doing for seven years. So, we went from like the pandemic, like now it's like everybody's doing it, right? Like that's what everybody expects. And there was a, a, a shift for, I'm sure, a lot of people that had to adjust to that. To us, it was like, it just ramped us up. It's like, man, what we've been doing is now acceptable and let's go all in. <laughs> let's go all in. And so, you know, my team is made up of, you know, because some people that are local in the offices, but virtual people as well. And when I go to hire, like, I, I don't care where you're at. Um, I mean, as, as long as you've got Wi-Fi and a license, I can send you a laptop and a headset and it's game on. I actually had an employee that worked for us for a short while that during the pandemic, uh, her and her husband were, you know, no kids in the house. And they're like, man, we don't want to hang out in Kansas. So they moved to Cozumel and she worked virtually for us in, uh, in Cozumel. And we'd be doing Zoom meetings where it's snowing outside of Missouri and got palm trees in the background for her. <laughs> so it is, uh, it was an amazing thing to be able to have the, the, the blend of the two. They're still dependent on the markets. Um, some markets, obviously, people want to come into the office. Some, they could care less. But to, uh, to be able to f- be and meet customers where they're at, that that's always been my goal. And then ultimately, like, we got to grow, we got to write business. And what's the best format for that? So I would like to talk just a little bit about this, because the same probably struggles you went through 15, 16, 17, learning, hey, what what does running an office virtually look like? That's what most everybody's going through right now. So if you could go back or what have you learned through the years that you've now implemented into running multiple offices virtually? I mean, you have four total agencies that you run virtually. If you had to narrow down one, two, three things that you're like, man, this is what I struggled with in the beginning. And this is what I've changed throughout time to be more efficient as a business owner leader in a virtual world. What would you say? So I think that's really easy. Um, communication is number one. Uh, number two is tracking of the activity and then number three is notes on every interaction like um i mean that's it right so communication right that is we've always used zoom um or or some type of um you know video where we can interact and communicate um that is just a straight game changer for us and we've used it for the whole time so where we have it now is we have a virtual office, right? So if you come to a job shadow in my office, like you, you're not coming to a physical location, you're just going to jump on Zoom. But we've set it up to where is there's breakout rooms. There's like, I don't know, 10, 15 breakout rooms that my team will bounce around from one room to the next, kind of like if it was an actual physical office. Um, you know, you just, you'd have your individual office. You want to go talk to Michael, then you just walk into his office and talk to him. So it is literally the same format, but it's the communication just is through the roof of what is available because, I mean, there is no reason for my 6'8 self to come sit next to you and, and talk to you and train you when 
we could be in totally different places or totally di- different atmospheres uh, and be able to screen share, be able to see each other face to face and um, and be able to communicate, be able to learn, be able to teach. So that Zoom format and using those breakout rooms has been huge. Uh, the scoreboard part of it and actually the tracking of the numbers is, you know, I'm a basketball player. So my coach always told me always no time and score. And in a sales industry that it's about activity, you need to know what you need to do every single day and you need to have accountability to it. So um, the one of the things that we do is every morning we have a quick little huddle with the team before the phones start going crazy and that whole tornado happens. Uh, we talk about the numbers and what we did from the day before. But the, I think that a lot of agents do that. I think the one of the things that we do that is different that really helps us is, I mean, just, you know, the Chiefs about to go to the Super Bowl. So imagine if Andy Reid was like, hey, guys, you go run this play today, run these plays, and, and I'll check in tomorrow and see how it went. So the in-game adjustments, I think, are really key. And so two really simple things we do are just having um, little quick huddles, like a 30-second timeout at 1130 and a 3.30 where everybody just barges into a call or barges into a Zoom room, and we run through our numbers. So, hey, this TJ's got five quotes. Stephanie's got four. Crystal's got three. Hey, John, you only got one. You know, our goal is to make sure that we got eight uh, every day, and it's, you know, it's 11.30. Like, you have to pick it up. So, hey, when we're back on there at 3.30, you know, make sure that you've turned that around by then. And so we're checking our, our key performance tracking, you know, characteristics of the calls, the quotes. Um, we also track talk time because we're looking for quality conversations um, compared to just the quantity of them. But obviously the end goal is more presentations, more quotes. Um, but those quick little timeouts, obviously 1130 is before they go to lunch and 330 is, you know, everybody's done at five. So 90 minutes left in the day to finish out the day. But when everybody leaves at five o'clock, they know you know, did we win or did we lose based on our activity? And there's no, I mean, again, I'm, I'm virtual, right? So I know what every person on my team is doing at any moment because we're, we're doing up to date tracking on their, on their activity and the activity that is going to help them to achieve the results that they want to achieve. The last thing is just notes on everything. So, uh, in a virtual world, like paperless is just a no brainer. Like you, you have to be paperless. So a person in St. Louis is talking to a customer that then the phone gets picked up later in Springfield. There has to be a note on every single uh, piece of communication. And the fact that we are just so particular about that, um, it saves us a ton. It allows us to, you know, cover ourselves if somebody says, oh, you didn't add that car. Oh, this, this didn't happen. So our rule is if there's no note, it didn't happen. And, because we're so adamant on taking notes on every single conversation, if there is no note, it actually didn't happen. Um, because uh, unfortunately, we are kind of guilty until we can prove our innocence when it comes to a customer, because the customer is always right. But mm, they forget things, like that they didn't add the rental car coverage or the roadside, but they only need it when they need it. And oh, I thought that was on my policy. Well, no, we sent you six renewals over the last three years and it was never on there. So it's not there, but the notes um, are just, uh, are so critical. So everybody has to have that. And and I'm not a a great organized person, but for one, to know that it's in there kind of a CYA type thing, but two, that, um, you know, say somebody picks up and, oh, Michael's at lunch. Okay, cool. Well, let me have him call you back. That's just totally inefficient and it's a bad customer experience. If someone has halfway decent notes, they can pick it up and finish it and move on. So we're uh, we're all about trying to help each other out. And and I think notes is, I, I, I probably maybe I'm preaching to the choir about it, but it's, it's critical in a virtual environment that we're taking notes in the system. Uh, we're not double doing it where we write it on a piece of paper and then we turn around and type it up. Um, you know, so if you're sitting at my desk and looking at what you could see right here, it's a phone and, a, and usually like two things of water, like a coffee and a drink, you know, and that's it because um, everything is put into the system without paper. Mm, I love that. So communication, tracking activity, and notes. Um, that's it. 
And the crazy thing is, is it's the same stuff you should be doing <laughs> in the office as well. Virtual, not virtual. Like that is a recipe for success. I completely agree. Here's my question, Paul. I think all of these are great things. How do you hold people accountable to this, especially in the virtual world of like, what, what's the consequence if you don't do the note? What's, what, what does accountability look like in your space? So I'll say that that, um, admittedly, that's a weak area for me. I can tell them their goals. I can help to coach them there. I may become mm, a little too overly optimistic when somebody's not hitting their goals. The, re- the reality, though, is that it's not long. If they're not doing what they're supposed to and everybody around them is, they quit. They give up. They move on. Um, and it's, it's it's the culture that that creates. Those, those three things, like, really – our, that's our culture, right? We're a virtual environment. We communicate with each other. So notes and tracking is, they're just other forms of communication that, you know, if you're not with us, you're, you're not with us, you know? So if you're not doing the things that everybody else is doing, they, they, they just don't stick around long uh, because we catch stuff, right? Like emails that didn't get responses, uh, you know, calls that didn't get called back. Um, it, it, it's quick to identify that. And I will just say that um, in probably the last year, there's only been one person that I had to let go for not meeting expectations. All the other ones that, you know, they, they kind of started falling off and they, they kind of let themselves out the door, you know? Yeah. I think it's, I think you're speaking to the point of like, this is our non-negotiables and everyone is on the same team with the same goals. And if not, essentially they're they're What is it called? Deselecting. They're like removing themselves from the organization of like, Oh, this is not a good fit. So I, I love that you have that in place and that that's just your culture of like, it's very much, this is the way it is. And if this is not something that's in alignment with who you are, that's cool. There's a door. Like, I think that that's great. I don't usually say there's the door. Like that's what they <laughs> kind of see themselves out, they, right? They like, move, they move uh, towards yes, the door. <laughs> right. Either, either you're moving in a direction of growth or, or you're, or you're not. And, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that we did, uh, at the beginning of this year that I think was really cool. And this is a, a recommendation from another agent that was awesome is coming up with our five core values. So who are we as a, as an agency, like like, who are we really? And um, in actually allowing the team to create those as much as sometimes I'll kind of impose my control. This one was one like, if these are if these are Paul's core values, they, they're not going to own them. But, you know, we had a couple of different conversations about it. We didn't rush through it. Um, we probably had three separate meetings, about an hour uh, a piece to come up with what were our core values. And then we'd live into those, right? And some of those core values are, you know, being a team player. Like you got to, you got to be able to help your team out. You got to be dependable. Um, they came up with some words that I had to look up in the dex- dif- in the dictionary, but like resolute, um, meaning like, hey, we are always determined, uh, unwavering, like focused on growth. I wanted to do growth mindset, and they didn't like that word, so we use resolute instead. But you know, these are just things that. Again, it's communication. Like we are always talking about our expectations. So I'd, I'd love to think that you could pull anybody on my team onto this call and say, what are your expectations each day? What happens if you don't meet your expectations? And just like any good team, it's not always the owner or the manager that is holding you accountable to your expectations. It's the rest of the team. You know, like you think of a basketball team or you think of the Chiefs, like, you know, if one of the players isn't getting it done, the other team, it, the, the other parts of the team are like, hey, we need you to step it up. Like, we can't win this game without all parts of our team. Mm. I love that. And that says something about your culture as well. And and I would love to dive into this because we were talking a little bit about it before, but you recently just had a kind of a culture change that you're going through and, and may had to uh you had to trim, trim some fat. And so I'd love to just talk a little bit about 
your experience, um, where you're at, the struggle you're going through and how you're kind of navigating those, those waters. Cause I, right now we're going through what the great resignation where people are either leaving their jobs or maybe some entitlement. And so I, I'd love to quiet talk. Quitting. A, yep. Quiet quitting. I'd love to talk a little Oof, bit about this. The quiet quit. That's a, <laughs> it, the track and the numbers. It makes that easier for that not to happen. Cause it's like, mm-hmm. You didn't do the numbers, so you didn't yeah. get the results. Yeah, um, it, it, it it seems it's like it'd be hard. It'd be hard to quiet quit in a sales environment where numbers and activity are everything. But um, you know what we're at is that you know for seven years uh, we just grew and grew and grew and grew and we're getting all the awards from all state and all the accolades, um, getting to speak at different events. I uh, went through a pandemic, and that was a, a really good time because we were accustomed to being uh, on Zoom and communicating virtually. To Then we got to the beginning of last year, and we got some entitlement in there, like thinking that we're good and feeling good about ourselves. So we stopped hitting goals. We stopped, we stopped hitting some of our expectations. And I think my culture shifted from a, like, we are just dead set on winning to like, well, but I went, I, we won for so many years, so I deserve this and I deserve that. And, um, you know, I had people on my team that, you know, thought that I needed to, to cater to them, uh, when they weren't achieving results. And so we've, we've went through a 12 month process of underperforming, like, like losing, and it is hard for me to even tell you that because it's always like win, 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 always be number one. Um, but we went through that and uh, it, like a, a repairing and a rebuilding of the culture is what has been everything to me right now. And, you know, so taking five core values, like this is who we are. This is what this is what we expect. Um, having people that, uh, you know, we make changes to the comp plan because there's changes in the environment like that. Uh, inflation is a real thing. The way that our company changes our comp plan has to be reflective of the way that I pay people. So, you know, you have underperformers complaining about the bottom half compared to people that are just crushing it, complaining that the top half is not enough. And I had too many people on the bottom half and having to work through and navigate that. So um, ultimately we, we've just decided Hey, we're, we're going to like the 300, right? Is is better to have 300 that are all in and 6,000 that are not? Um, we, we've stuck to a smaller team with people that are committed to doing things and doing things the right way. And I'll protect the culture as we continue to grow. Um, I've told them that I'm actually going to jump into and start producing with them, start showing them the expectation. You know, we're in Missouri. It's the show me state. So a lot of talk and a lot of years of coaching. I'm going to show them like this, this can be done. You've got to do it in a certain way. You've got to have some expectations. You've got to commit to being successful. You have to commit, like burn the ships, like their failure is not an option. And I think that that is probably the core of some of our problem in the last 12 months, because me personally, as an owner, it was okay for me to lose because we got a big agency and I can pay my bills and I'm all right. It was okay. And luckily I had a friend call me out and said, man, your goals are weak and you're too comfortable. You need a bigger why. And so I took some time to really evaluate that for myself, uh, decided that I was sick of losing. I was sick of um, underperforming, sick of having to deal with all the negative stuff that you have to deal with when you're losing. So kind of like the Grant Cardone, like you got to have 10 X goals and you have to commit to them that there is just burn the ships failure is not an option come with a plan and attack and that uh, that's really where i'm at today and that my team is smaller we are building our way back but we're building our way back in the right way and um it's really exciting but it took 12 months of being uncomfortable and in convincing myself it was okay and several people to just be like it's not good enough for you man that's that's not paul living his best life affecting people in the right way. And, uh, and I want to be better than that. I want to be better than that for my family, for my team, for myself. So that's where we're at today. So good. 
Michael was actually just talking about the 300 this weekend. So I'm glad that you, you brought that small, <laughs> small but mighty up. And, and I think it's important to mention just for context, when you say that you were crushing it, I mean, how, how many agencies do you have and how big, I mean, they're big, you have big agencies. Well, so Wait. for Missouri are a really good side agency. So we have 10 and a half million in premium. We've got four different agencies. We've, We've merged two of them and we just have two physical locations, but, um, you know, a good good size agency. And what I thought back when I started seven years ago is that's the number, get to 10 Mm -hmm. million. The problem was when you got there, but what's the next goal? And so luckily uh, I had a couple of people slap me around and I had uh, some really difficult things that I had to go through that led me to be like enough is enough. And now we need the next goal. And then it'll be the next goal after that. So so what's the new number, Paul? Uh, well, so that's a great question. Um, the number is we need to max out our, our bonus plan for this year. But I will share with you just what, what is really my why. So it's not max the comp plan and get this certain number. It's actually uh, in doing that, um, my, uh, my son is seven years old, told me he wants to go to Indonesia. I want to go to Bali. And um, you know what? Uh, to tell my seven-year-old, like, we're going to do that because daddy's going to make a big goal. The team's going to accomplish it. Uh, I'm going to become a better person for chasing after this goal, which that's what got me to where I was at in the first place with chasing number one, chasing being on the top, chasing after the Michael Weavers of the world that were great producers. Like, what are you doing, man? Tell me. I need to know. I need to know. I need to get better. To stopping trying to get better. And so, you know, my big goal for myself is that we're going to crush this year. We're going to hit our agency goals. We're going to max them out in our comp plan. And then next year, I'm going to take my my family to Indonesia. I, just, I, I can't even believe that that is where we're going, but that's where we're going. And I told my wife today, I'm going to tell my kids later this uh, this week. And then there is no going back on that because there is no failing your kids or your wife. Um, and that to me is, uh, that's really important. So it's, uh, that's the goal, um, to be able to accomplish that, but it, I'm, I'm really excited about the journey and, and attacking that journey and being a part of that as I, as I grow and going after something compared to, uh, to being comfortable. Yeah. I'm all fired up about that. I think that's so, <laughs> I, I think that's incredible because you having a purpose and having a passion is by focusing on that everything else is going to fall into place. I think that's just how it works. But I'm curious as you go crush it as a producer, then you take on the owner role and that's a different role of managing and what, what your day to day and your identity looks like. Now you're getting back into the trenches. So I'm curious when you, when you talk about, all right, this is what we're going to focus on. What is your first, like, okay, you as not only the leader, but also doing the work as well, what does that look like for you? Well, so obviously I'm going to have to balance out um, being able to produce and still running the agency. Um, I think that, uh, you know, trying to trying to be resourceful and trying to build a structure for myself that really helps is nice. So, um, you know, we use some uh, VA, some virtual assistants that help run reports for me. So I'm not spending time digging and pulling up reports in different places. So that I can just jump on and pop, pop up my numbers and there they are. Um, one of the things that, again, this is brought to me by other agents, but actually creating a sales associate. So, you know, if, if you're going to be the top dog, if you're going to be the best of the best, this, this is what I had eight years ago in Oklahoma. I had a sales assistant that was helping to source quotes for me, helping me with the back end stuff that at the end of the day, the, the best salespeople are only good at one thing, and that's talking to people. So how I'm, I'm trying to think in my mind, how much time can I give to myself talking to people to give myself the best chance to be successful at producing? And then how much can I take off my plate and put it somewhere else? So a virtual assistant will help. You know, they, they do my payroll. They help with tracking of my stats so I don't have to go pull them from different places. Um, the sales associate that will help source some quotes for me. Um, they'll also help with back end stuff, check in with underwriting on, on those type of things. Because, um, although, 
Uh, I will also even take inbound calls, customer calls, because we look at those as huge opportunities too. Like a, an inbound call from a customer is a lead because um, they already are buying from you. So they're open to other products if you can position it in the right way. So to think that, all right, I got a, a customer that calls in that's got a, a car change. Like that's really easy, but that's an awesome opportunity for me to to do a review with them that can be short and sweet. Um, but if they're missing a product that I can present it. And at the end of the day, it's always been for me so important that the one thing I'm focusing on in every, every single call that I, I take or make is that I'm trying to create a wow experience. So not just always sell the policy, but create a great experience for the customer or for the prospect. So then you could become referable. Like you did such a good job. They would feel bad not giving you a referral. And I think that somebody told me that somewhere along the way, um, but it, it always really resonated with me of like, I'm not just going to sell the policy and then oh, now I got to ask for a referral, but I'm already tired from selling the policy. It was like, that was the, cl that was the climax moment for me to ask for the referral, not to get the banking information. That's like, I'm expecting and I'm going to get the sale. But what I'm really working on is connecting with a person and earning that referral and that, um, you know, kind of like a, a waiter or a waitress, right? Like from the moment that a person sits down at a table, they are working that tip, like right? working that tip the whole time. Like that, and I, I worked in, you know, a, a restaurant before and that's what I was doing from the moment, you know, and then, and then you spill a drink on somebody and it's like, well, pff, I got I to have to double down to make this thing work, you know, like, oh man, the rates are really bad. So I'm going to have to really lay it on this person to get my referral piece. But I think that um, that has always been a, a big key for me is being, being that referral center. And so, you know, how, how, again, am I going to work smart and not just hard is making every experience referable, getting those referrals, using that sales associate, using some of the virtual assistants and actually in a really budget friendly way too, and being able to do that. So I can stay focused. Hmm. I love that, man. I love that you're talking about the wow experience with referrals because everyone always wants to know the magic bullet on referrals and it's, yeah, you got to be referable. You got to offer that wow factor that you're talking about. And you, and I also love, you're like, all right, expect the payment information, man. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's a given. That's I'm a getting given. the sale. I'm going for the referral, but that's a mindset. And I love you're going into the cell already knowing you're going to close the business, or at least that is the mindset you have. And so working for that tip, I, I dig that. Brother. I, I feel like we need to coin for Paul. I think doubling down on service to get your referral, like you saying like double down, like if we all had that mindset of we, sp we just spilled the drink on somebody, how do we get the tip? Like how much better would we treat our customers or potential customers of like, how do I make their experience? Because most of the time when a customer is ca calling in, it's, because of something not great, like freight changes, there's an accident. Like, so how do we go from the drink spill into making their experience great? I love that you said that. Like it is a double down. And, double and here's down the thing. And I think that everybody is experiencing this right now. Rate change, right? Every company's the, the rates are increasing, you know, like eggs. We know about that. Uh, my little kids, the, the happy meal is eight bucks like that. It, it's everywhere. So the customer that calls is like, my rate went up because, I, and I don't have any tickets and I don't have any accidents. What happened? I'm like, well, the world happened and inflation happened, right? But we've created a really simple process that is a seven step process that we practice and practice as our team that we can be really confident in that, again, like, can I always change the rate? No, but can I still create a good experience for them when they make that phone call, when they, they're calling in, like they might be really mad. But we've got this process that we follow that my team is really comfortable in and really confident. And the cool thing about it is like, you know, maybe there's agencies out there just getting beat up on these rate calls. And, and, and maybe that's really draining on their team members. Like, man, oh, another rate call. Like it's not going to change. It's probably not going to change for a while. So, you know, we just decide we'll go flip the script on like we're gonna turn this into an opportunity uh, and create it as a referable opportunity. And that's the that's the mindset that you gotta have going into those calls because 
that's probably it. Like you spilled a drink on them. It's just like their rates going up. Like, okay, great. So let's, let's see what we can do to help you out here. And, and know that it is not about let me dig in here and find every single way to save you money. It's actually reinforcing what they actually have too. You know, we have people call that have great policies and they're complaining about a rate increase. It's like, I mean, you can go shop it around if you like, but ain't nobody going to beat that. Or maybe there's somebody that is, but the reality is they have something really good. They just don't know it because in what other industry do you pay for something that you every single month, but you don't actually know what it is and you never, ever use it, right? So when you're trying to save money and you see your rate went up by 200 bucks, like, of course you're upset, right? Of course, because it's not like the eggs that you have to buy that you're like, well, okay, I'm eating eggs. They still taste delicious. I still got to eat them so I can put some muscle on. Like, you know what those are like, but ours is a totally intangible promise that is only once in a blue moon ever fulfilled. So it gives us a, a I think you kind of set it at like doubling down or creating a referable experience. The cool thing is that their expectations of us are so low in the insurance world. Like, they don't expect to be wowed. They don't expect to be like crushed with kindness and, and, and helpfulness and, you know, sending out handwritten cards that take two seconds. Like they don't expect that. It's like, you know, my wife, like her expectations for me are like way up here. Right. And this is my go- my goal every single day to crush those expectations. But that's not the same for the insurance people. They're way <laughs> down here. And the cool thing is that if they're already really low expectations, the, the, the consistent uh, intentional efforts that we make to connect with people and to go above and beyond, uh, they create that good tip. They create that referable opportunity because that's what we're thinking about in our mind is not, it, it is how do I make this customer feel good, right? Like it is what it is. The rates are going up everywhere. That's great. But how can I make this person feel good? How can I make them feel like, I'm on their team. We're, I'm, I'm so glad you called me today, Courtney. I got you. I'm glad that you called me. Everybody's going through this. And I think um, a person told me this on my team that I thought was really interesting. Like, if you're standing there, like, soaking wet, you don't need a meteorologist to tell you, like, because it's raining, you don't need a meteorologist to tell you how the rain works. Um, maybe you just need an umbrella and, like, hey, it's raining. Here's a solution. Um that is just this kind of you don't have to give them the whole story of the baromic pressures and with the clouds and the cumulonimbus and all that. Like nobody cares, right? Nobody cares about every reason that the rates are changed. They just need somebody to give them the basics. Here's what happened. Here's what everybody's going through. But you know what? You got me. And I'm gonna help you through this. And we're gonna figure it out. But then not just, oh, let's go save them money. Let hey. You got this discount on here. It's this much. And one of the things we're always real specific, like you're getting a multi-policy discount. It's $402 a year. That's awesome. Oh, hey, you're getting this because you pay in full. There's another discount for that. And we'll give them the specific amounts because they are only looking at their increase. We want to tell them about the good things on their policy and remind of those because they don't remember because they don't know. <laughs> and so even just sometimes we don't change anything but we've reminded them how good of a policy they have and they feel good about that. Right. It's like my taxes go up. Like, what am I going to do now? Like just be so mad. I'm going to move to another state. I don't know. That's possible. Right. So anyways, no man, this is so freaking good. Are you going to ask the question or you want me to ask it? (laughs) Go ahead. What's the seven step I, process? I, yep, you, I'm oh, like a dog. I, I'm like a dog with a bone over here, dude. Like that oh, was exactly seven. what I was gonna ask. <laughs> Man, yeah. Well, I mean, so. now I'm like, uh, like you have me sold. I love your philosophy, and I love how you're, how you're taking this opportunity. This is an opportunity with the, the rate increases. But now I'm like, all right, give me the deets. What's in the in the biggest thing before we go into the seven steps is you're talking mindset here. Like your team is looking at this as a true opportunity because. Look, we can't control the rates in, in this inflationary environment. I mean, this is a this is going to be around for a while. Um, I mean, reports are looking at twenty four to thirty six months at a minimum. So, if I'm a producer in my chair right now or agent in my chair, it's how can we switch 
the flip? How can we switch the mindset exactly what you're talking about? So I love that you're sharing this because this is huge. It's making it an opportunity, right? If it is what it is, then what is the opportunity? And, uh, and it's actually more than anything, it's an opportunity to connect with our customers. Most customers aren't calling, but every couple of years for a vehicle change and the once in a blue moon that they have a claim, they're not calling us, but they're calling us. And the thing is, I bet most people that listen to this, they've got great customers that we'd love to think that those customers give us the benefit of the doubt before they're like, you changed my rate. You did it, Paul. You, and I'm like, I don't, I didn't do that. Oh, that that's all I'll say. But I'm, I don't know where it came about that you think it was me. I don't pick on people like that. Um, <laughs> but to, to think that, you know, really everybody's going through it and let's just use that as an opportunity to connect if these people are calling because they are giving us the benefit of that. Like, Hey, I noticed my rate went up. What happened? Cool. You ain't mad at me. You're just kind of curious. And to actually get in that frame of mind of like, you know what? They called and asked me why the rate went up. They didn't call to cancel. That's a win. Right? So, Hey, thanks for calling me. You got me. That's, that's step one, right? Hey, thanks for calling me to ask me about this. I'm so glad that you called today about your rate increase. That's number one. You're going to have to straight flip the script right from the beginning. Like, oh, man, oh, no, it's Monday, and the first call I took was an increase. This ruined my whole week. It's like, no, hey, thanks for calling because you didn't call to cancel. You call me first. Okay, there's plenty we could do here, right? Let's talk. Um, so that's step one. Do you want me to go into the steps now or? Yeah, we'll yep. and I'll just keep them really simple. And again, this yes. is picked and pulled from so many other people. So I don't even know if I could call it mine. But um, number one, right, to greet them with a, hey, I'm so glad you got me today. And like, I'm glad you got me right. And if they call and, it, it, you know, if it's a team member or, or whoever that they're calling and looking for the agent because their rate went up and forget that. Hey, you got me today. It doesn't matter who that is. And Paul can do the same thing that everybody else on his team can do. So having the confidence when somebody calls and said, it's something important. And like, hey, you know, so I could let them know before I transferred over, what is it? Well, my rate went up and I'm not happy about it. Oh, you know what? I'm so glad you mentioned that because I can help you with that. I'm the person to help you today. Thank you for calling about this. So actually acting and showing some gratitude that they call because they called to ask about it and inquire about it, not cancel. So that's the start. Second thing, or part of number one, is to greet and to thank them, right? So the number one, hey, you got me. I'm so thankful you called. This, this, the second part of that, number one, is to look and see how long they've been a customer and thank them for their business, for however long it's been. Hey, Michael, you've been a customer for 10 years. Man, thank you for being such a loyal customer. Thank you so much for being a loyal customer. So right there in the first 30 seconds, I set the tone of this conversation. Like, I'm thanking you for calling you. I'm thanking you for being a customer. So step two is to listen. Like, really listen. And, and what are they saying? What do they need help with? It may be a claim. It may be a rate change. It may be whatever it is, right? Just really listen and, and hear out what it is that they need help with and help them with the task. Um, we look at every call is an opportunity and a lead and an opportunity to do a review, which leads to the ability to recommend gaps and coverages that need to be covered. Um, so the next thing that we're looking for, you know, what are some ways to, uh, we look for our home run, right? So if you could save somebody, you could sell somebody something, if you could raise their limits, if you could create a wow experience, if you could do any of those things, um, you've, you've created a home run for yourself and you, you're, you're starting on that path to, um, uh, to creating that referable experience. So then step four is we haven't went into the review yet and we haven't started looking for ways to save. Number four is we're going to start looking at the discounts and we're going to highlight the positive discounts that they have. We're going to highlight anything positive that we can find on their policy. So, hey, you've got a loyalty discount and then we want to give them the specific amount. And for me, when it's a discount, I was going to give them the bigger number. So if anybody has six month policies, I'm going to take that number and I'm going to double it, right? So if you're saving $100 every six months because you pay in full, like, hey, you're saving 200 bucks for paying in full. Like, that's awesome. And we're going to give them at least two examples of good discounts that they are 
they're getting. There are some discounts that a lot of times people are missing with our policy and with, with all states' companies. So we will be quick to try to point out, hey, an accident's fallen off or here's a discount that you can try out. Um, pet, you don't, you're not taking advantage of going green. That could save you a couple percentages. So um, we're going to point out the good things that they have and then we'll offer some solutions. Um, the fifth thing that we do is actually just a baby terms review. And I say baby terms because I'm a, I'm a basketball player, so – I'm not that smart, but I promise I can explain insurance in a way that it's really simple that, you know, my seven-year-old could understand. And that's how it should be. We shouldn't be using words like liability and personal property umbrella protection. Like nobody even knows what that means, right? Using baby terms. So we do auto and we do three key coverages with an auto policy. We do home. We do three key coverages with the home policy. And in that way, we can remind them of the good coverages they have but also just kind of a quick review. Um, so hopefully we're creating people that actually know what they have on their policy, but they're going to forget and they're going to call me in a year anyways, but we still try to keep it simple. Um, from that review, that's where if you, you notice somebody didn't have an umbrella policy or they only have a home with us or they only have an auto, that it's not, it's not transactional, it's relationship and, and more of an advisor base because I went through these couple steps to get here to now recommend an umbrella policy to you or now recommend that we do your home compared to, hey, Courtney, thanks for calling in. Uh, I took your payment, but I also noticed that you don't have an umbrella with us. I can add that on for 15 bucks. Like this is not like you're not standing in line at Walmart trying to buy a candy bar before you check out. Like that's transactional. They don't actually know what they have. So using this process gives us the reason to recommend the right coverage and to cover the gaps. And that might mean a policy, that might just mean an increase in their limits, but we're looking for that every time. And that increasing anything on their policy, even if it's we bump up their property damage, you know, double that coverage. And hey, that only that's only a difference of a dollar a month. You know, that's a big deal. Because even if they spend an extra dollar on their coverage, it's them buying in more to the value of us as advisors and us as the person that cares about them and protects them and the value of the product that they actually have. Um, I think that, oh, I can't remember who said this, but you know, the, the perception of value is what is so key. And people may not perceive insurance as really important because they're not really thinking about it. They're not thinking about getting an accident. So when we bring back some areas of value and they buy into certain coverages, that uh, that makes a big difference to them. And then the last thing is the, uh, you know, did we create a wow experience? So if we did, we're going to ask for referrals. I love that, man. I told you that was short and sweet, but I just get a little too hyped up about going through this process because it's, it's fun to do it. It works and it, uh, it gives me confidence every time I do it. It gives my team confidence every time they do it, but you got to follow the steps. Um, you skip right to, let's see what we can do to save you. There goes the value as you as an advisor. Now you're just a cost cutter. Yep. So every part matters. And from those seven steps, you'd like to think that maybe there wasn't a product that I could, that I could sell, but that person felt connected to you. And if you ask them, hey, who's you mentioned your brother lives across town. Like, I'd love to call him, just do a quick review, see if he's in a good spot, see if we couldn't put him in a better position and ask. <laughs> I'm so fired up for this. You, this this is gold and it's um it's really easy to follow and I love how it's like every ingredient matters because it really does to get to your desired outcome of like what you're building throughout your conversation and really deepening that connection. The second step that you do about thanking somebody for their business and the time frame is something that American Express does every single time you call in and they are known for their customer service. So the minute you said that, I was like, oh, we are we are providing a different experience here. So if you're listening to this podcast right now and, and wanting to up your referrals, if you didn't take notes, go back, re-listen to what Paul just shared about the seven steps because every element of that really does make a difference in not only getting the referral, but but your connection to your customer. And you can do this on every call. This just isn't your, your, 
hey, my rate went up call. I mean, this is the recipe for success on any customer service call. I mean, it doesn't matter if they're adding an auto or whatever it is. Like, hey, you should be thanking them for their business. Hey, anything else going on? Do a baby review real fast to see if there's any gaps that you can offer solutions to create that wow experience. So this is... This is phenomenal, Paul, man. You you crush, brother. <laughs> you know what? You, it, it's interesting you say that all, all those pieces um, really mattering um, because they do. And a lot of people ask, like, how do you ask for a referral? I'm like, man, I start that from when I pick up the phone and I tell them, that, you know, it's a great day at Allstate. This is Paul. Not, hey, this is Paul at Allstate. How can I help you? Everybody <laughs> says that. Man, it's a great day at Allstate. This is Paul. <laughs> oh, hey, this is Courtney. Oh, Courtney, I'm so glad you called today. Hey, thanks for being a customer for five years. Like, set the tone from the beginning of this is you're going to give me a referral because I already got this process and it works every time. You're you're going to so there's not a I mean I could tell you how I ask for a referral, but it's the whole process that gives you the, the just the easy like, hey, you mentioned your brother. Like, I'd love to call him. See if he's in a good position. There, there's nothing fancy, but it's the whole process and uh and it's funny you know you, you said something like this is this could be used on every call the reality is my team's sales skills are being sharpened by taking customer service calls and being a helpful customer because you know if they get a customer where they're in a tight price bind with somebody that they're trying to sell as a new customer now they know how to work the policy because one, of the, one a word that i love is offset not hey Courtney, let me see what i can do to save you money on your policy because of your increase. But hey, we experienced some rate change. Let's see what we can do to we can't do to offset some of that premium. And one of the things that we've gotten mm. really good at is you might have the Cadillac of policy that got the like the wood grain and the leather seats and the and the heated steering wheel and all the fancy stuff. Right. But when we get into a period where you're tight on bills, you might not need all of that stuff. So there's things that we can always change, whether it's raising a deductible or take an accident forgiveness off, or some of the things that we don't need that, like if something happened today, it's not going to be devastating to you um, to make sure that we're offsetting premium, but that we're making sure that we're putting the right coverages. And that if something did happen, that we've got the protection that we need for what is devastating. I always talk about insurances for devastation, not for just little minor things. So, you know, a $500 deductible compared to a thousand dollar, like there's no big deal. But having to pay hundred thousands out of pocket in a time when people are tight on money, like that's a real, real problem, you know. And I think uh, we oh, even the wording, right? A lot of these companies have went to one and two percent deductibles. Like, hey, you got a thousand or five hundred? Like that's silly. You do the math for them and show them, like, look how much you're paying over the next three years. You don't have a claim. Like you should just kept that money in your pocket. Don't pay it to me. But a way to present that is, hey. You pay 99%, or, or no, 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 let me say, you pay 1%, we'll pay 99%, right? Like that's that's the way that it works. And even that's a, so I think that the way that they uh, are using offset in the premium, we're skimming policies to what do they really, really need? And what is maybe just some of the bells and whistles that we don't have to have, but we don't sacrifice the most important coverages. So, I will tell you, admittedly, we are not lowering liability limits. We may adjust some coverages, adjust some deductibles, but a lot of times we're adjusting deductibles and then adding an umbrella. And they're happy that they called in about their rate increase because now they got more coverage and they may even be saving. They just don't have some of the things that they don't really need. Or they're paying more. Yeah. Either yeah. way. Because <laughs> you, you provided the, value. Yeah. You provided value. 90% of consumers say they are willing to pay more for something if they find value in it. So I freaking dig this, Paul. <laughs> you're like, screw saving money. Let's make sure you're covered. Let's make sure you're protected. Hangnail versus heart attack. This is like the good old days. Like, this is like the good old days. You're, you're like so fired up right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's ready to make some phone calls. <laughs> I know. Well, okay, but there I we point go. Some, but I want to point something out just real fast, and I hope everyone noticed this, is not only is it a formula, but when you went into like when you went into it, like, hey, thank you so much, 
that enthusiasm, like that good energy, that is a transfer of energy from you to the customer of you setting the tone of the call. And I think that that small little piece gets overlooked so much. And that was one of the first things I noticed when you went into it, you kind of did your example role play, the energy, like the enthusiasm that you had. And so you can have the best formula in the world, but if you're not genuine about it, it doesn't matter either. So thank you so much, Paul, man. If, if anybody wanted to connect with you, what would be the easiest way for them to connect with you, follow you? Are you on socials, your email, maybe what's up? Um, you know, you can find me on Facebook, our agency's PJB Financial Agency with Allstate. Uh, my email is just paulbannister at allstate.com. You know, send me an email. Um, I'm welcome to share my cell phone number if anybody ever wants that. But uh, it took uh, an army of people to help me to get to where I'm at. It's going to take an army of me to be able to build to the next level. Uh, I would talk to anybody that, uh, you know, is maybe struggling or need a little bit of help or if anything that clicked in here that is helpful, I'll talk to anybody. And I think that that's so cool about what, you know, what you're doing here and people that if somebody's listening to this right now, they want to get better. They want to, they want to level up their game. And the cool thing about what you're doing, Michael and Courtney is that, you know, if anybody had, Hey, what can I do? What can we do? Well, how can we get better? I know you guys would help them. And you're trying to put really good content in front of people that are trying to get better. They're trying to work through some of these struggles that we're having in the insurance aging. And so, you know, showing up on this call, listen to me blab on by some of the stuff I've been saying for the last, however long, like you want to get better and reach out to people. It's all available to you. So probably the difference between, you know, me and you, Michael, like 10 years ago, when we were producing, like you had to drive to go visit somebody. You had to call them on the phone. Now, man, listen to the podcast every week. Come on, right? Like get out there and just, you know, find what's available right at your fingertips. And this is so cool that you guys invited me to do this. And I'm excited to be uh, being on these calls more and listen to some more of this content. But uh, but honestly, if anybody ever reach out to me, I could ever help anybody. I'll, I'll talk to any company. I'll even talk to the State Farm people. I'll probably <laughs> even talk to Geico people if they want us some help. But um, it's, a, it's, about, it's about protecting people and taking good care of people. And that's what we do every single day. So, I uh, again, thank you guys for having me on here. This is a lot of fun. And uh, energize me just sharing some of the stuff that we do. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. You got it, brother. So thank you again. And for all those listening, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you. As always, time is the most valuable and important asset that we all have. We appreciate you spending time with us. Go out and make it great.